This video was sponsored by KenHub. More on them at the end of the video. Hello and welcome. My name is Patrick, and in this video, I'll teach you some of my tips and tricks for remembering all of the skeletal muscles of the abdomen that you would see in an anatomy class. And to make this lesson more manageable for beginners, I'll present the list in smaller chunks of four to eight muscles. You can find a list of the sections and timestamps in the description below. And with that out of the way, let's get into the muscles. The first chunk is the abdominal muscles, and you have four big ones to remember here. Luckily, they all follow that straightforward and predictable naming convention. What most people know as the abs is the rectus abdominis, those showy six-pack muscles. It uses the rectus nomenclature, meaning a straight muscle, plus abdominis, which is self-explanatory. Now, the rectus abdominis is actually surrounded by a sheath of connective tissue, and there's another muscle in that sheath called the pyramidalis. It's triangle-shaped, attaching to the pubic symphysis and other parts of the pubic crest. If we peeled away the rectus abdominis, we'd find a layer of muscle that wraps all the way around the abdomen called the external oblique, and under that, the internal oblique. The layers are obvious giveaways, the internal is deep to the external, but you might not always know which layer you're looking at. Fortunately, you can use the direction of the muscle fibers to tell them apart. The external oblique fibers run this way and look like they're pointing up, while the internal oblique fibers point down. To remember this, I imagine an extrovert and an introvert at a party. The extrovert is looking up and happy, while the introvert is like looking down at their drink, just like the external oblique fibers point up, while the internal oblique fibers point down. The final muscle in the abdomen is the transverse abdominis. It's called the transverse abdominis because it wraps around the entire abdomen, literally starting on one side of your vertebrae, wrapping all around your abdomen, attaching to the ribs and pelvis and the other side of your vertebrae. This muscle is a big, wide muscle that transverses your entire abdomen. On the back side of the abdominal wall is the quadratus lumborum, a name that has the memory device built in. We know that quadratus means square-shaped, and lumborum is the region, the lumbar region. As we move on to the back muscles, your saving grace will be knowing your vertebrae skeletal anatomy. So let's do a quick review. Here's your run-of-the-mill vertebral bone. This big piece in the center is called the spinous process, and these pieces on each side are called the transverse processes. So if you see spinous or transversus in the muscle name, you can start thinking about attachments to the spinous or transverse processes respectively. Another quick note, some muscles are big muscles that span the entire spinal column, while others are multiple tiny muscles between each vertebrae. I'll do my best to make it clear which are which. The most familiar is probably the erector spinae, the group of muscles that straighten the spine, as the name implies. At the gym, the erector spinae is usually illustrated as two column-shaped muscles that run up your low back, but in reality, they're a group of muscles. Just like how when people say the quadriceps, they're referring to four muscles, the erector spinae group is three muscles, the iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. Here's how I think of it. All of these muscles go superior-inferior, and they all have the common goal of straightening the spine, so we know that they'll run parallel to each other. So once you find those long bundles of muscles, you just need to label them from medial to lateral. The most medial is the spinalis. And remember how I said that the attachment on the vertebrae helps us find the names? Well, the spinalis attaches to the spinous process of the vertebrae. The spinal process is dead center, so it's as medial as it gets. Lateral to that is the longissimus, the thickest and longest of the erector spinae muscles. Branches of this muscle literally run from the pelvis to the base of your skull, and because it's so long, it's called the longissimus. Finally, the iliocostalis has one of those intuitive names. It connects the ilio and costal, or the ilium, to the ribs. You can see from its origin on the pelvis how lateral this thing is. So from medial to lateral, the erector spinae is the spinalis, longissimus, and iliocostalis. But the erector spinae has one more detail before we're done with it. Each of these long muscles are made of tinier segments, like the iliocostalis has three sections that line up with each region of the spine, lumbar, thoracic, and cervical. Having this kind of segmentation allows us to move sections of our back independently. Like, if the erector spinae didn't divide further, every time we straightened our lower back, we'd also crane our neck backward. The erector spinae group is the big superficial muscle group, but underneath it lies the more delicate transversospinalis group made up of the semispinalis, multifidus, and rotators. This is dumb, but I remember this group because the names sound like deliciously Italian? The first item on our menu is the semispinalis group. Now, we already learned about the spinalis muscle, which connects spinous process to spinous process, but these are semispinalis because they connect the spinous process to 
something else. The semispinalis cervicis, for instance, originates on the transverse processes of the upper thoracic vertebrae and inserts on the spinous processes of cervical vertebrae. The semispinalis thoracis does the same thing, just lower on the spine. It originates on transverse processes, then inserts on spinous processes. Then there's the semispinalis capitis, which originates on the vertebrae, but inserts on the back of the skull. The next item on our little Italian menu, the multifidus, is one of those muscles made up of tiny segments that span the length of the spine from sacrum to skull. It sits in that little valley made by the transverse and spinous processes, and it's mainly there to stabilize the spine during other movements. I remember this one because it's made of multiple tiny muscles, hence multifidus. And even deeper than the multifidi are the rotator muscles. They connect the transverse process of one vertebrae to the lamina and spinous process of the vertebrae above it. These muscles are so small and deep that they stabilize the spine more than they rotate it. But because they're so horizontal compared to the other long erector muscles, I can always remember that these should be my rotator muscles, as the name implies. Now, depending on which anatomy book you have, you might only see the rotator thoracis presented. They're the most developed and easiest to find, but rotator's colli in the neck exist as well as the rotator's lumborum in the low back. Okay, we're done with the Italian menu, now on to dessert. The interspinalis are exactly what they sound like, tiny muscles between the spinous processes of the spine. Many people don't have them in their thoracic spine, so you'll almost always see them in the cervical and lumbar spine. As for memory devices, that prefix inter is doing the heavy lifting here. It tells us that these guys go between the spinous processes as opposed to over them, like the larger spinalis muscle. Likewise, the intertransversarii are found between the transverse processes of the same vertebrae for the same reason, inter and transverse. As we move on to the thoracic wall, you'll hear a certain Latin term repeated a lot here, costal. In anatomy, costal refers to the ribs. So the intercostal muscles refer to muscles that go between the ribs, hence intercostal. You have two sets, the external intercostals and internal intercostals, both of which connect rib to rib. As the name implies, the internals are deep to the externals. Fair warning though, some professors throw in the innermost costals as a third deeper layer of muscles, but you should be fine knowing just external and internal intercostals. Separately from those muscles are the subcostal muscles. And here's where those prefixes come in. The intercostals went between the ribs, but the subcostals go under the ribs. Specifically, they're found on the inside surfaces of the backside of the ribs, closer to the spine than the skin. The last muscles using that costal Latin root are the levator's costara, in the back. They attach the ribs to the thoracic vertebrae above them, and as the name implies, when they contract, their position lets them lift the ribs. Next up, a muscle with a shape right in the name, the serratus posterior superior and serratus posterior inferior. Serratus refers to the serrated shape, this kind of jagged, sawtoothed pattern. It's the serratus posterior, since there's another big serratus muscle around the ribs, the serratus anterior, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Finally, there's a superior muscle and inferior muscle to indicate their position. They're relatively far apart, so it's pretty clear which one is superior and which one is inferior. One pro tip, the serratus posterior superior and rhomboid muscles are both in similar spots. So if you find yourself confused, remember the naming conventions. The serratus muscles have that jagged appearance, while the rhomboids will have a more geometric appearance. If we return to the front of the ribs, we find the transversus thoracis, a group of muscles on the inside of the chest wall making this cool diamond shape around the sternum. I remember this one because it looks like it transverses or covers the entire front of the thorax. Finally, the diaphragm. This muscle is so unique and interesting that I never really needed a memory device for it. It's this wide muscle that attaches all over the inside of your body. It's your main muscle of breathing and separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. This muscle is so essential to our daily life, give the diaphragm the respect it deserves and memorize it on its own. No memory devices required. Now, these are just the tricks that I personally use to remember these muscles, but if you want another great resource for learning anatomy, then you need to check out KenHub. I use them all the time when researching and writing these videos, and for this series in particular, their written articles and atlas of muscles have been extremely helpful in refreshing my knowledge of some of those deeper or smaller muscles. They've also got an enormous library of in-depth videos about muscles, histology, vasculature, nerves, and everything else you'd need to know in anatomy class. All those beautiful illustrations that you saw in this video came from them. And in addition to their library of content, I also love KenHub's quiz feature. 
They allow you to build custom quizzes with different difficulties, and they give you feedback so you can figure out where your weaknesses are. You can use most of KenHub's features for free, but if you want full access to all of their learning content and quizzes, then go to khub.me slash corporis to get 10% off your subscription. They've also got a no questions asked, seven day money back guarantee, so you can try out the premium version for seven days, and if you don't like it, get your money back. If you wanna see the next video in the muscle memorization series, then check out this playlist here. Otherwise, subscribe, leave a like on the video, have fun, be good, thanks for watching.